Hello everybody, welcome to a new episode of The Dissenter. I'm your host Ricardo Lopes and today I'm here with Dr. Stephen Sanderson. He is an American sociologist. He was a professor of sociology at Indiana University of Pennsylvania and since 2007 he has been a visiting scholar at the Institute for Research on World Systems at the University of California, Riverside. His areas of focus include comparative sociology, historical sociology, sociological theory, and sociocultural evolution. He is a specialist in sociological theory and comparative and historical sociology, and is one of the leading sociologists to develop a Darwinian understanding of human society. He has also written or edited 10 books, including The Evolution of Human Sociality, A Darwinian Conflict Perspective, Evolutionism and Its Critics, Human Nature and the Evolution of Society, and Religious Evolution and the Axial Age. And I have two of them here with me today. I usually don't have them uh, in paper version because I usually read most things in ebook format nowadays. But anyway, I have here uh, Human Nature and the Evolution of Society. Uh, yeah. And the other one, Religious Evolution and the Axial Age. So, two great books. I've read uh, the other two that I've referenced also. And so, Do Dr. Sanderson, thank you a lot for taking the time to come on the show. You're very welcome. Okay, great. So, so I, I mean, today we're going to focus a lot, perhaps, on the... Um, a theoretical basis of sociology, because I guess that as a scientific discipline, uh, sociology is a bit complicated uh, in a very specific way, that is. Um, it doesn't have uh, a theoretical... Uh, s uh, theoretical core, let's say. I mean, there's not a central theory the, uh, from which all the discipline and its branches stem. Uh, and basically, we have sort of traditional approaches to it that, for example, Dr. Lida Cosmides and John Tooby called the standard social science model in mm. their 1992 book, The Adapted Mind. Mm. So, first of all, could you tell us about the traditional approaches that we have to sociology and perhaps... Um, work by people like Weber, Marx, Durkheim, and people like that? Okay, that, <laughs> that would be quite a challenging task if I go clear back to um, Marx in the 19th century and then Weber and Durkheim in the, in the early 20th century. Right. But um, I would say that most sociology since Durkheim who died in um, 1912, I think it was, um, owes more to him than to um, any other of the early classical theorists. Durkheim's basic pronouncement was that studies, you can, you can explain social facts only by means of other social facts. And by social facts, he meant um, phenomena that transcend the individual. Uh, he was strongly anti-psychological, opposed to any kind of psychological or individualist explanation. Uh, these explanations he thought didn't work. And um, since that time, or actually starting a, maybe a decade or two later, sociologists have, almost all sociologists have embraced this doctrine uh, in many different forms uh, as I'll try to describe in a minute, but uh, um, that idea explains social facts only by means of other social facts remains central to um, uh, sociology. Basically, this what what Durkheim was proposing is what Tooby and Cosmides now call the standard social science model. 
uh, you can explain social phenomena only in terms of other social phenomena. It's the social and cultural environment that shapes the individual uh, rather than the individual uh, shaping the socio-cultural environment. So that's the so. Tubi and Cosmedes are, are quite right, and this is a characteristic of sociology. It's also characteristic as much or uh, more than uh, anthropology. Psychology is a little bit different in that it, ha it has, uh, uh, many psychologists have often taken a more individualist approach, but it too has largely adopted the standard social science model. I won't speak of other social science disciplines like economics, since uh, I'm not quite sure what they're doing and don't understand economics very, very well anyway. But those three core social science disciplines have for uh, three quarters of a century, if not longer, adopted the so-called standard so, uh, uh, social science model. Theories have proliferated, however, uh, in terms of this model. There are lots of different perspectives contemporary or more recent perspectives um, that um, advocate some kind, one or another kind of uh, standard social science model. If we go back, if we want to start with contemporary theory, we can go back about to the 1940s with an approach called functionalism, which dominated sociology for maybe about 20 to 25 years from the 1940s to the, um, sort of the middle of the 1960s when it came to be severely criticized and then gradually, uh, rather quickly actually, uh, replaced. Basic idea of functionalism was that you study the, the functions of the individual elements of society much in the way that biology or functionalist biologists study uh, human organisms or other kinds of organisms. Uh, you look at the parts and you try to decide what the functions are and why those parts are there, why they may be uh, essential uh, to the functioning of society. After about 1965, this approach came under severe criticism and was replaced by something called conflict theory, uh, which was largely traceable to Marx and to uh, Weber. Most conflict theorists, it turned out, uh, were more on the Marxian side than on the Weberian side. Um, this was an approach which argued that something like individuals are constantly competing with each other in society for things like wealth and status. Some groups uh, rise to the top and come to have a dominant status, uh, and, and, and they end up uh, oppressing or exploiting other uh, members of society. In Marx, of course, it was the capitalist class or the bourgeoisie, which was the ruling class, and it dominated and exploited the large class of proletarians. Many of the conflict theorists became neo-Marxists and took a view something like this. Weber argued that conflict was, was that the Marxian model was rather limited and that um, um, conflict was, was broader. There were other forms of con other important forms of conflict besides class conflict, such as uh, a political conflict, uh, social status conflict, conflict between religious groups, conflict between ethnic groups, and so on, and that these were not, uh, re they had a kind of independent status of economic or class conflict were not reducible to class conflict. Well, another uh, sociological approach, uh, and that, that still is around, conflict theory in one form or another is uh, still around. This approach was called symbolic interactionism, and it was a very, uh, we would say, voluntaristic or indeterminist approach. Uh, individuals define their own meanings. They construct uh, uh, their own reality, and society is sort of a mass of individuals who, who, who do this social constructing and this construction. They didn't explain very well how or, or in what way they did this constructing, they sort of implied that constructions were somewhat arbitrary or 
um, um, well, I'll just say are, are arbitrary or undetermined. Um, this, from my point of view, is the most serious weakness of the approach. It doesn't. It has an indeterminist rather than a deterministic perspective. But there's still lots of symbolic interactions around. There's still conflict theories around. There are a handful of functionalists, but there are not very many. I doubt that they comprise more than about 5% of the whole discipline of sociology. Uh, well, um, what else? Uh, uh, well, well, just to sum it up, uh, could we say that the standard social science model that has been dominating the social sciences pretty much ever, uh, ever let's say, uh, can we say that it is an approach that deals with the human mind as tabula rasa, that is, human mind as a blank slate, and yes. that basically tries to explain uh, how our psychology works and also how our societies work simply by referencing socio-cultural constructs right. and basically by trying to create a sort of a web of social cultural constructs or meanings that basically provide us with our view of ourselves, of others, of our societies, <laughs> and even of reality itself. You put it very well. I don't think I could uh, say it much better. And uh, that view um, uh, sort of transcends all of all of these theoretical approaches. Um, Standard social science model is rather anti-psychological, and uh, it's also rather uh, anti-biological. Uh, I saw you, some of your interview with Lita Cosmides, and of course, she's one of the founders of evolutionary psychology, and she thinks it's psychology and the brain, uh, the cognitive structures of the brain, which are central. And I've adopted a lot of the ideas of evolutionary psychology, although um, prior to evolutionary psychology, we had what E.O. Wilson called sociobiology. And then later, people like Tubi and Cosmides and uh, uh, Daly and Wilson changed the name to evolutionary psychology. Uh, Wilson says that, uh, you know, Wilson says that sociobiology and evolutionary psychology are the same thing. Cosmides, I know, uh, strongly objects to that. I would say they're very similar, but there are some uh, differences. I still like the term sociobiology because the, the work that I'm doing is a little different and in some ways uh, uh, quite different um, than what the evolutionary psychologists, particularly Tubi and Wilson, are. Uh, uh, Tubi and Cosmides are, are, are in fact, um, doing. So I've moved in this direction, but I'm one of only a tiny handful of sociologists who've moved in this direction. Anthropologists and psychologists are now the most prominent representatives of sociobiology or evolutionary psychology, whatever you want to call it. There must be hundreds of them. I never counted, but there must be hundreds of them. There can't be more than a dozen or at most two dozen sociologists. Um, I've recently written an article called uh, Evolutionary Psychology and Sociology for a new uh, handbook, a huge three-volume, one-million-word handbook of evolutionary psychology, and one, one of the points I make is that sociology has lagged way behind anthropology and, and psychology in, in embracing a kind of evolutionary psychological approach. Um, I've jumped ahead, sort of. Uh, one of the things that began to happen in the 80s and 90s was the rise of uh, what was called social constructionism, and then, of course, as you would <laughs> obviously know, uh, postmodernism. And um, um, yeah, I mean, even these approaches that we're talking about with social constructionism and even deconstructionism as well, <laughs> and post-structuralism uh, and thinking about the mind as a tabula rasa. I mean, uh, people also use. Uh, the common term of postmodernism or postmodernist approaches to encompass all of this. Right, right that's right. Um, postmodernism 
has as the central core a kind of um, social constructionist idea. Everything is socially constructed. Um, and, and, and one of the conclusions they draw from this is since, since social life is socially constructed by the mind, uh, then and since social constructions don't have any clear causes, or if they do, the, the constructionists don't say very much about them, then it's possible to change your constructs. And uh, the social constructionists and postmodernists are, are, are very political. They want to change society, and they want to change society by uh, talking about changing our constructs. Um, and that's a very interesting point because isn't it the case that the fact that they are so politically motivated that that very easily leads them toward political bias and that's also another one of the reasons why if we apply this standard social science model to the social sciences of course uh, I mean we get to a point where we start coming up with hypotheses or theories that are not really fa falsifiable at least from a certain point onward yeah. and uh, also they don't have really very good predictive power. I would say they have almost no predictive <laughs> power whatsoever. Um, you can say if you want, well, society is socially constructed, since if we look out at the world, we find societies that are radically different from one another, um, from small-scale hunter-gatherer bands through simple horticultural societies, the agrarian states of the past and now modern industrial societies. Um, but, the, but the key question is, what are the determinants of these social constructions? Uh, they're not free-floating as the construction is. Yeah, I mean, they, they're, not, they're not completely arbitrary nor random. Right, right. They, and that's what the constructionists and the postmodernists are saying. They can be anything, and, and, and um, I suppose the most famous of the of the postmodernists was Foucault, who um, was tremendously uh, political. He focused on power. Everything is about power, you know, uh, uh, about people oppressing other people. And he saw this far beyond the, the Marxian model. You know, power power is everywhere, and every everything is rooted in 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 power. And so, I guess we might say Foucault does have a notion of. Uh, what has an influence on social constructs, and and this is power. But power is itself for for Foucault is itself a social construction. Uh, and it's interesting because people talk a lot about Foucault, and he yes. was mostly a philosopher. But would you also classify him as a sociologist because he talked and theorized so much about human society? Yes, well, right. He was a philosopher, uh, you know, one of the most famous French philosophers of the last, say, 50 years. Mm -hmm. But as what the postmodern postmodernism overlaps into philosophy. It started in philosophy and literary criticism, and since then has expanded into uh, sociology and anthropology. Um, I suppose the economists haven't been significantly influenced by it since they're doing very, very different kinds of things. Postmodernism is also pretty much, it's the most radical of the, of the social constructionist views. And, um, and I mean, because at a certain point there, at least some of the postmodernist philosophers uh, they seem to try to convey the idea that even the structure of reality itself, or at least the way we perceive it, is also socially constructed. Yes, this, uh, um, yes quite right. Um, this is true. Uh, what I was going to mention earlier, they're also radically anti-science. Science is not a privileged way of knowing. It's not a royal road to knowledge. It's just one way of knowing, no better than other ways of knowing. It's just another narrative. Right? Exactly. 
Yes, you put it very, very nicely. It's just another a narrative. Since you mentioned the word narrative, um, the philosophers, the postmodernist philosophers, um, talked about what they called meta narratives, and they were they were deadly against meta narratives. These are things like well, evolutionary psychology, sociobiology, conflict. These are all meta uh, meta meta narratives broad theories that attempt to explain a lot of things so they were they were they were death on uh, the meta narrative focus only on small things individual things like Foucault wrote this book the birth of the prison um, which was all about power of course <laughs> yes but yeah I can see that you have a good understanding of these things which is nice to see Okay, thank you. So let's perhaps just take a step back, because I think that back in the 19th century, right after Darwin published uh, On the Origin of Species and other books, there were some people that immediately tried to apply evolutionary theory to human society. Like, I have some names here, for example, uh, Edward Westermark, Thomas Huxley, Francis Galton, Herbert Spencer. I mean, so it seems that immediately after Darwin first presented his broader view of what natural selection would be about and how it would work, there were some people that came immediately after him, and even Francis Galton was a cousin of his, uh, that, tried to uh, that tried to apply this evolutionary theory to, uh, to an understanding of how human society would have evolved and what would have been the biological basis to it. But it seems that uh, it didn't get a lot of track and over time uh, it didn't get uh, very popular particularly, uh, I think, because it also got associated with very negative uh, social movements, like, for example, the eugenics movement. So yes. do you think that that was one of the primary reasons why uh, it went out of, uh, of popularity, let's say? I, I'm not sure about that. I, I, I think... Um, it went out of popularity somewhat later, maybe in the 19, I, I would date it really to the 1920s or 1930s. I'm glad you mentioned Westermark since I'm a great fan of Westermark. I was going to write, a few years ago I thought I'm going to write a book on Westermark and then I decided not to because I thought no one is going to want to read this book. I can't, won't sell very many copies. Maybe no publisher will sign it. But I have written an article on Westermark, which I published uh, last year in uh, um, the Oxford Handbook of Evolution, Biology, and Society. I titled the article Edward Westermark, the first sociobiologist. He was really doing uh, what we today call uh, sociobiology or evolutionary psychology. He wrote a great book. It was his doctoral dissertation at the uh, University of Helsinki. He was a Finn and um, the book was called A History of Human Marriage and he talked about a wide range of things. The most famous thing he talked about was the incest taboo and he developed a Darwinian uh, theory of the incest taboo which has now been a for years it was considered a ridiculous theory and was completely repudiated. Uh, but in the but last now we know it's true and it, it seemed it, 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 it even may be true. Yeah, I, oh, I, okay. yeah, I hesitate uh, to say that a theory is true because as soon as we say that a theory is true, somebody comes along with some falsifying evidence, but it looks as though it is true. There's a great deal of evidence of various kinds uh, to support it. Uh, uh, and we're talking about the Westermark effect here. Yes, exactly. It's called, some people have called it the Westermark effect. And uh, I caught on to it. Well, I, it's not fair. I, I, many years ago, when I was a, an advocate of the standard social science model, maybe going, that would be going back 30 or 40 um, years ago, 
I heard of Western Mark. I didn't pay any attention to his theory. And 40 years ago, nobody was paying any attention to his theory except to say, well, it's a ridiculous theory and there's no evidence for it and so on and so forth. But um, so Western Mark has been revived about the same time that we've made the transition beginning, I would say, in the, in the 1970s uh, to sociobiology and then uh, later evolutionary psychology. Westermark was very highly regarded. He was at uh, the, uh, the University of London, and he also shared a, uh, uh, a position with uh, uh, the University of Helsinki, and he divided his time between, between Finland and, and London. He, he also did a great uh, deal of fieldwork. He was very highly regarded. He, I can pull out quotes from all kinds of contemporaries of his, saying what a what a what a what a great sociologist he was. Uh, I said in the article I wrote that he has the greatest um, erudition, the greatest uh, cross-cultural mind. He has a vast knowledge of a whole range of human societies. The sociologist who's best known. Uh, for that is Max Weber, but he pretty much limited himself to to earlier historical societies uh, and didn't look at Smolska abandoned society. But it, but Westermark had an enormous amount of of uh, knowledge of this and, and and was able to present all kinds of evidence in support of his theories. He wrote a two and his other main uh, subject was human morality, and he wrote a two volume work on that. Uh, uh, later on, and he developed a very interesting Darwinian theory of morality based on what he called the moral emotions, and the moral emotions were universal, and they had evolved because they were adaptive in uh, promoting individuals' interests, and of course, from a Darwinian point of view, those are uh, those are survival and reproduction, reproductive success. But to just finish this main point, by the 1930s, Westermark died in 1939, but by 1930 or 1935, his ideas were dead. And, 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 and the sociologists and the anthropologists turned against him, and he, he declined into obscurity, hardly ever to be heard from again. Um, but now it's the standard. beginning of the of the SSS, SSSM, the standard social science model that had begun to take over, and so uh, Durkheim, Durkheim and, and Westermark had a great rivalry, and, and, and they disagreed on almost everything. They wrote very critical things uh, about each other, but it was Durkheim who won. Durkheim Durkheim won out, and Westermark declined. Uh, in, into obscurity, almost never to be heard from again until some of us revived him uh, beginning in the, in the in the 70s and 80s. I'll go ahead, you have another uh, question. Yeah, but uh, wasn't it also the case that perhaps approaches like the ones by Westermark and others went out of fashion because at a certain point uh, there, w there were some uh, anthropologists, for example, like Franz Boas and Margaret Mead that went and studied certain uh, societies in certain places of the world, particularly, for example, the Pacific Islands and other places. Uh, and they sort of exaggerated uh, the way by which their practices varied across them. Yeah, uh, well, uh, Amid, uh, who was a student of, of Franz uh, Boas, she and Ruth Benedict were, were two of his most famous students. Uh, she studied Samoa, and um, she argued uh, that she argued all kinds of things about Samoa uh, that, uh, in, in, in fact, uh, she tried to argue that in Samoa there are all kinds of practices, especially sexual uh, practices, um, which are quite different. Well, at, at, at any rate, uh, Boas wa was an advocate of the, in general, of the standard social science model. Uh, Boas was basically anti-scientific. He said, we, we don't understand why 
societies have the practices they do. They just have the practices that we do, and we can't explain them. Benedict took the same point of view, and I suppose me took a, a very similar view. Uh, and, 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 I, and I mean, that's another problem with this approach, is that if we simply focus on trying to explain everything from a social sociocultural constructionist approach, then it, it always begs the question that is, where do these things come from? Yes, exactly. That is that is precisely my view, and I, I spent a lot of time arguing with my colleagues when I was still uh, teaching full-time. I said, my, my colleagues would get annoyed with me for my criticisms of symbolic interactionism. Basically, uh, I said, symbolic interactionism is useless. It's worthless. Uh, anything which it might say that could possibly be true is already contained in, uh, in, in, in other approaches. But my main criticism was exactly what you've pointed to, that uh, it doesn't identify the kinds of conditions, whether they're economic or, or, or political or ecological or demographic conditions, uh, that are behind certain kinds of social constructions, that social constructions are not arbitrary and uncaused. Uh, they can't be just anything they want. And this is what sociobiology and evolutionary psychology now show, that there are certain human universals. The in incest avoidance is a, a virtual human uh, universal. Certain mating patterns uh, are, are human universals. Well, if these things are universals, uh, it doesn't make any sense to say they're arbitrarily uh, constructed and uncaused. If they're arbitrarily uh, constructed, then there should, there should be a great deal of variation among societies in, in what these things look like. In some things there are, but in, in other things like uh, avoidance, uh, marriage practices, mating patterns, and so on. There, there, there are uni many of the aspects of these things are universal, or at least uh, extremely widespread. So they come close to being universal. And a social constructionist view cannot explain cannot explain those things at all. Yeah, and even the variation that exists among different societies, these kinds of approaches can't really explain them, right? Because, I mean, they don't take into account the fact that perhaps we have a certain set of psychological traits that are universal and then we deploy them differently in different ecological conditions. Yes, very good. Um, somebody invented the term socio-ecological context, and I can't rem I, I picked this term up, I liked it. I don't know who coined that term. Um, I rather suspect it was the anthropologist uh, Richard Sosis at the University of Connecticut, um, who does the kind of evolutionary psychological work that some some of the rest of us uh, do, but uh, socio-ecological context is the entire set of contingencies in which individuals find themselves. And they're social, they're cultural, they're ecological, they're demographic and, you know, po population parameters, how big the society is, how densely populated it may be, and, and uh, so on. So these things don't, so the, the Cosmini and Tubi's like, uh, uh, like to talk, and to be, I should say, uh, talk about modules, you know, that the mind has modules, and these modules are domain specific. They, they, they don't. They, they have basically evolved to deal with uh, a certain specific evolutionarily relevant problem and to yes. solve it, right? Yeah, exactly right. Um, what was I saying? I think <laughs> uh, you were talking about modularity of mind and domain-specific modules. Uh, yes, I buy into this. The sociologists radically reject this. Uh, my colleague Jonathan Turner at the University of California uh, attacked me on this. I gave a talk there. 
when I was first out there in 2007 about modules and um, no he said the, I was talking about religion and some of the new evolutionary theories of religion he said a general purpose mind is perfectly adequate for constructing religious ideas. There are no such things as modules, and uh, I've been un I was unable to convince him of that, or really almost <laughs> anything that he, he didn't agree with. But he still holds this view. And yeah, but I mean, just to be fair, the modularity of mind approach to the human mind, let's say, uh, it's still not completely proven in the sense that we don't have enough evidence that uh, the the entirety of our psychology let's say is composed of different uh, modules all of them that are domain specific perhaps that uh, there are a couple of them that are domain general and that might yes. overlap with others so yes. the, pic the picture uh, there is not completely established that is right um, one of the weaknesses, and I think probably it's the biggest weakness of evolutionary psychology, particularly in the work of Tuvi and Cosmides, is um, nobody has ever found these modules, you see. No, in, if they're but modules, you're the brain, we, need a, we need a neurological, we need some neurological grounding. Um, I gave a talk. Uh, perhaps some neural pathways, at least, or something yes. like that. Uh, I've been told by a student of Tubi and Cosmetes that the modules aren't just in one little tiny part of the brain; they're spread, they're spread throughout throughout large p parts of the brain. So a module doesn't mean just one little thing in one part of the brain, um, but it does mean that it is 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 domain specific. Uh, mating behavior. Take a simple example. All over the world. And this is clearly a culture universal. Men prefer as mates younger women, and when men marry polygynously, they they may start with w one wife and then they keep adding. So after after maybe ten years or fifteen years, they may have five or six wives, but the wives get progressively younger. So there's if the man reaches age if he's 20, he may prefer a 16-year-old wife. I'm talking about a band or a small-scale band or tribal society. Uh, but when he's 40, he doesn't change his uh, preference to then taking on 40-year-old wives. He still wants younger women as wives. This is a cultural universal, and and Tubi and Cosmetes would say it's it's part of a specialized module. Why? This would be adaptive. How would it be adaptive? Well, younger women produce more offspring. They're more likely to get pregnant and they're more likely to produce offspring. Women by the age of 40 or older uh, may have reached menopause and may not be able to produce any offspring anymore. So if a man wants to promote his reproductive success, he will choose, uh, he will choose young, uh, young women um, This is cultural universal. It's found. It's found everywhere. And when men when men divorce their wives, maybe after twenty years of marriage, and they want to remarry, they look for younger women. This is just found everywhere. It's common knowledge that this is that this is what happens. Um, now, but, men don't know. This. Men don't necessarily know this. They don't. They don't know that they're trying to re promote their reproductive success. This is an unconscious mechanism of the brain, and it drives men towards certain kinds of preferences. Uh, and the same can be said for women. It drive, their specialized modules may be slightly different and drive them for, you know, they pref tend to prefer older men rather than younger men. Older men tend to be better established, to have more resources, to be able to provide for children and so forth and so on. That's one of the keys to sociobiology and evolutionary psychology. It looks for human uh, universals. So even the socio-ecological contingencies uh, don't tend to override this, although they do affect it. They do, in, they do in influence it. If we found a society, and, and I say in, in my book, Human Nature and the Evolution of Society, if we found a, if we found several societies in which 20-year-old men regularly preferred as mates 40 to 50-year-old women, 
well, then that would call into question uh, a, 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 a key idea of, of uh, evolutionary psychology. But I don't know that any such society has ever existed. At least no one has ever reported on it, to my knowledge. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I mean, at a certain point there, you refer to human universals, and I guess that that's a very crucial issue to talk about here, because uh, it is one of the things of the, of the many sources of evidence that we have that really point toward a biological basis for at least certain human behaviors. And yes. w w wouldn't you say that perhaps we have at least several sources of evidence that all of them point in the same direction. So we have, for example, human universals, and we also can compare us with other species, particularly our clo close primate cousins like the chimpanzees and the bonobos and others. Uh, and, w and we also can study children at very early stages of development. Beca because if they show certain patterns of behavior and even in terms of gender differences, if very small boys and girls already show differences before they can be s properly socialized, then that also points to yes. the biological basis of human behavior. Uh, and, and also things related to neuroscience and brain base, the brain basis for behavior and things like that. So, I mean, it's very hard to deny if we collect information uh. from many different sources that there really is an undeniable biological basis to uh, most of human behavior perhaps yes yeah well you identified three things that are that uh, um, are useful as forms of it uh, of evidence to to indicate that there is a biological basis is the is the behavior universal in human society doesn't necessarily have to be totally universal it might be what is called a near universal might be found in 98 percent there might be an occasional exception um, but it's universal or or is a universal or near universal secondly it's uh, found in other animals uh, uh, especially those that are most closely related to, to us and it's found in young children uh, say at age two or three before significant socialization influences have have developed and then the fourth kind would would be are there hormonal uh, are there horm hormonal um, factors for example the uh, the male sex hormone testosterone is about ten times the level of testosterone in males is about ten times the level of testosterone in, in uh, human females. Testosterone is known to be related to aggression, dominance, and status seeking behavior. And so on. So those four kinds of it. And if you've got all four, if you've got all four, um, then I think there's a pretty good likelihood that there's a biological basis to it. But still these things are influenced by socio-ecological contingencies so they don't always take the same form in different societies um, um. yeah but, but again even when they vary isn't it the case that they don't vary randomly? That is, even in society spread throughout the globe, there are recurring patterns when they deal with similar yeah. ecological circumstances. Yes, right? yes, quite, uh, quite true. You're, you're exactly right. Society can't be just anything we want it to be. Uh, and, and, and modern day... Uh, political radicals don't get this. They don't understand it because they have this, partly because they have this hostility to biology and they have this hostility to biology because they think, well, if things are biological, then we really can't change them. That's not entirely true, but um, that's been the main reason for the hostility to uh, 
biology. The social standard social science model is deeply embedded in our culture, not only among social scientists, but among um, laypersons. I talked to my daughter about these things. She's actually a counseling psychologist. Oh, I think things are determined by the environment and so forth and so on. Well, she has to believe that because if you're going to treat individuals who suffer from anxiety and depression, you assume their environmental causes and that you can that you can work on them so that you help individuals get rid of or reduce their levels of anxiety and and um, depression and and and, and isn't isn't it also the case that even if things were really environmentally determined that we still would have to uh, take a biological perspective on them because i mean the same uh, exact environment doesn't have the same effect on humans and other species. So to explain why that doesn't happen and why, for example, other species uh, like dogs or other animals of companion don't acquire language, for example, even though they are exposed to it, w we would still have to resort to a biological explanation, right? Yes, going along with the point you make there, all of these movies, the um Planet of the Apes movies, well, they're rather ridiculous in, in, in most of their assumptions. First of all, they treat chimpanzees. The very first one uh, treats chimpanzees as the, as, the, as the least aggressive and the gorillas as the most aggressive. And so, in fact, what we've learned since the first uh, uh, Planet of the Apes movies uh, came out about 50 years ago, chimpanzees can be extremely violent. Uh, uh, much more so, actually, uh, uh, than uh, gorillas. Um, I had another point in there <laughs> that I wanted to make. Um, uh, well, we were basically talking about perhaps comparative psychology, comparing humans to other species, and also explaining why yes. by, by being exposed to the same environments and environmental factors, different species don't develop uh, the same sorts of behavior. Exactly. What I wanted to say about the, uh, the Planet of the Apes is, well, you know, they start at the beginning. Um, people took chimpanzees into their homes and made them into domestic servants. And, and as a result, chimpanzees learned language. Well, that is a ridiculous assumption. Chimpanzees don't have language, at least not in a natural state. Some psychologists have tried to teach them language, but they can only teach them a little bit, and they can't teach them truly verbal uh, language. They they teach them language is structured in a in a very different way, and and, uh, and and they work mostly with sign language, right? Right. Mm -hmm. uh, they don't speak. They can't say, "I'm having an interview." tomorrow with Richard uh, Lopez or anything like that. So I think all of those, ex uh, all of those experiments trying to teach uh, uh, gorillas and chimpanzees uh, uh, language are, they don't mean anything. They're doomed to failure. These, these, uh, these species don't acquire language. And then in the Planet of the Apes, the chimpanzees take over well, the primates take over the gorillas and the chimpanzees and the and the um, orangutan. Uh, they take over and they dominate humans who who lose language. The humans don't have any language. The whole premise or set of premises uh, 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 of that series of movies are utterly ridiculous. But you see, they're based on the standard social science model. Well, we can teach we can teach chimpanzees language, and we can teach them how to. Uh, uh, overcome humans, overthrow humans, dominate humans, and nonsense, nonsense, total nonsense. Mm -hmm. It proves your point. It, it proves your point. So we've been referring to culture and how cultures vary and how they also have a lot of human universals. So I would like to ask you, 
what is the best way to think about culture? Because I've been talking with a lot of anthropologists and psychologists and people that do work in cultural evolution. And I mean, it's not straightforward the way we should think about culture, because it seems to me that on the one hand, we have to understand what are the cognitive bases of culture in terms of the the mental tools we had to acquire through processes of natural selection to be able uh, to be able to have culture because that really explains why other animals don't have culture at all or if they do it's a more rudimentary form right. of culture yes. but on the other hand it seems that, and particularly through approaches like gene culture coevolution, that at a certain point or in very specific circumstances, a culture starts um, uh, having a part in what we call the environment and, and can also start uh, creating some selective pressures and then uh, there are situations where we perhaps can talk about culture as also having an effect in terms of both genetic evolution and also the kinds of behavior that people tend to develop and adopt. So uh, I, I tend to think of culture as mostly a biological phenomenon, but what would be your take on that? Yeah, that's a difficult question. Um, I can offer, um, uh, you're not talking about when culture originated with humans tens of thousands of years ago. You're not asking that question. Uh, no, 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 not at all. Not asking that question. I don't like the term culture, and I usually, I, I, I try to avoid using it because the usual definition of culture is that it's a set of ideas that people share, and, and this totally eliminates um, behavior. So if I'm going to use the term culture, I want to define it as a, you know, a, a learned and shared set of ideas and behaviors and material uh, implements like tools and technology and, and so on, people have objected to my definition saying, well, it's a grab, it's a grab all definition and it, 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 it's too broad. But this ideational definition of culture, limiting it to a set of ideas, I think is, um, it, it is problematic. First of all, I take the view that, that it's really behavior that, that leads to the ideas more often than it's the ideas that lead to the behavior. I can give lots and lots of um, examples of that, but um, I, I, I'll give the following example, uh, some a technical one, but I think uh, I think people you'll certainly follow it easily, and I think the audience will follow it also. In uh, in human societies, there are systems of descent. People trace their lineages from ancestors. Well, in in modern uh, industrial societies, we have a system called bilateral descent, in which descent comes through uh, both the father's line and, and, and the mother's line. We don't trace our ancestors just to one line or the other line. But in small-scale societies and in some large-scale societies like ancient China or India, uh, people uh, practice uh, most commonly patrilineal descent, which is descent through the father's line. Uh, others may be making up about 15% of those societies practice matrilineal descent, which is descent through the mother's line. There are all kinds of interesting uh, nuances to that, which I really uh, don't want to take the time uh, to go into. But uh, is matrilineal descent, uh, in matrilineal descent, descent through the mother's line, um, the person who, the, ma the male who is primarily responsible for bringing up young children is, is the mother's brother. The father plays a role, but he plays a secondary role, usually. Um, in patrilineal descent, the father is the key. The mother's brother uh, has a, a much 
lesser role, uh, if, if any role at all. Well, you can ask then the question, well, are patrilineal and matrilineal descent systems of ideas or are they modes of behavior? In the case of matrilineal descent, uh, after a boy reaches a certain age, he often moves into the household of his father's brother and it, uh, of his mother's brother, and his mother's brother teaches him all kinds of things uh, that are useful, that will be useful to his adult be behavior, and uh, so on. Well, this is this is behavior. It's not just a set of ideas. So do people sit around saying, well, let's have matrilineal descent. That would be a good idea for our society, and thus we will behave in certain kinds of ways. I would suggest that probably the two evolve together, but the behavior sort of starts... And, and, and then it sort of gradually leads to the idea that, well, the mother's brother is a key, is a key relative. Uh, the mother's brother has already started, I think, to be a key relative. And then it's sort of after that that people begin to think about and talk about and transmit to the next generation the idea that uh, the mother's brother is a... a uh, a key relative. Pay attention to your mother's brother. You know, you have to obey your mother's brother and so forth and so on. Um, so that's a problem I have with the term uh, culture. I like, as I said earlier, the term socio-ecological contingencies, and that includes economic, ecological, political, social, cultural, all of those things. Some are more important than others. In, in some societies, uh, some one or two of those may be more important than they are in other societies and, and uh, so on. Um, but um, that's sort of my answer. I'm, I, I, I'm not sure if that really answers your question or not, but uh, I resist using the term culture. I once was planning to write an article in which I stated that we should banish the term culture. It's too uh, uh, misleading. I never got around to writing it. I, I wasn't quite sure how to do it, so I moved on to, <laughs> uh, to other things. But is that helpful in answering? I don't, I don't know if that's helpful in answering uh, your, your question. Uh, yeah, yes, it is. But let me just put forth another idea that perhaps will be useful to explore this a little bit more. That is, so in terms of genetic evolution itself, uh, basically the way biologists look at it is that there is very vari variation among individuals and genes predispose to certain behaviors in some individuals and to others in other individuals and the ones that perform the behaviors that lead to uh, higher uh, fitness, let's put it that way, yeah. uh, are the most successful ones, reproduce more, have more offspring and eventually those behaviors increase in frequency in a given group or a given yes. population or society yeah. or even across the species, let's say. So, uh, couldn't a good approach to the way we think about culture B, instead of thinking about ideas themselves and how people transmit ideas to one another and those ideas would then influence their behavior in terms of adopting uh, a strategy or a behavior in, uh, instead of the other, instead of the opposite behavior, let's say, that there would be perhaps different individuals or different groups of people that they would be predisposed to prefer certain practices and over time there would be ones that wouldn't work at least in that kind of environment and yes. others that would work and then because those people would reproduce more have more offspring and their genes would increase in frequency in that specific society then uh, basically, what I'm trying to say here is that uh, 
a, a, an increasing majority of people would be, would be genetically predisposed toward preferring those sorts of behavior and also we can include perhaps in the picture the fact that uh, even their families also communicate uh, their practices to their young and to their descendancy and that perhaps would uh, tweak a little bit the way they do things but uh, I mean uh, uh, at the end of the day I don't think even that in order to have a full account of how what we call culture works, we even have to resort to ideas that much. Yeah, I think, so one of the things I, I see you as saying, I hear you as saying is that biological nature itself helps to construct the culture. So the culture is derived, uh, at least in large part, um, by the biological predispositions. Um, let me try to let me try to try this out on you. Um, you're familiar with the famous group, the Yanomama Indians of of, uh, of oh, the the horticulturalists that uh, Shagnon stuff. Yes, yeah, right? yeah, yeah. called Shagnon. the fierce people. Yes, sh sh exactly. Shagnon. Well, the men, the men are extremely aggressive, um, and they're intensely warlike people. Interestingly, Shagnon has shown that um, they have the word. The Yanomama have the word Unokai. Unokai. U n o k. A, a, a unikai, a man who's a unikai, is a man who's killed another man. And a, man, a unikai has very high status, uh, very high prestige among the Yanomama. Well, the unikais tend to have more wives than the non unikais It's a small-scale society, uh, and, and, and therefore the unikai might only have one more wife. Among the Yanomama, many men don't get wives, okay? Um, they're simply unsuccessful for a variety of They're unsuccessful in attracting women uh, to, to, to mate with them. But the Unikais can get mates more frequently than the non-Unikais, and they're more likely to be in polygynous marriages, although that may involve only um, uh, only a couple of wives rather than say five or ten or fifteen of them. Well then, the, you know, if the Unikai is having more offspring, the offspring will share his genes. And gene, if a Unikai is a highly aggressive man, then he's having a lot of children who will inherit his genes for aggression and the biological predisposition for aggression will then over time spread in the population. So among the Yanomamo, uh, they may be biologically, and I suspect they are, biologically more uh, uh, prone to aggression uh, than, than lots of other societies of, of, uh, of other types. That's an example of how biological predispositions create a cultural pattern in which the culture emphasizes the fierce people, male aggression, um, and so on. Is that in part answer your question? I don't know if it, it answers your question or, or not. Well, I guess that it does in part because what I was trying to refer to is that mostly things don't have to happen at a conscious level. I mean, people are not really uh, teaching, I guess, the Yanomamo men to be aggressive or saying uh, uh, overtly that you have to be aggressive. It's just that perhaps... Uh, those men are more predisposed toward aggression yes. and then the way people talk about it and perhaps also the way they um, 
uh, I mean, in terms of ideas, perhaps at a more or less conscious level, perhaps when they talk about themselves and communicate to one another, if you were to ask them, probably most men and most women in that society would say, oh, men have to behave that way and women have to behave this way. Yes. But... but it is not exactly that they had to invent culturally those sorts okay. of behavior, but simply that they are predisposed to it, and some of it gets to uh, arrives at a conscious level of awareness, and also by, of course, observation over time. Yes. Th th they talk about it that way, but it's not the fact yeah. that they talk about it that way necessarily that influences people to behave that way. Yes. Um, sociologists like to talk about socialization. People are socialized into a culture. But you know what? In the, in the introductory textbooks, there's always a chapter in near the beginning, maybe chapter three or chapter four, in socialization. But sociologists don't have a theory of socialization. They end up reviewing theories of socialization, if you want to call them that, that, that come from other fields. They, they talk a lot sometimes about Piaget and his cognitive developmental. Well, this is not sociology. They import these ideas from other fields because they had no theory of socialization. Um, other than to say, uh, which is awfully simple-minded, members of an older generation teach. They communicate a set of ideas, a set of preferences and ideals and social norms and so on to the younger generation. But what we're learning is this is really uh, not, not quite the case. What I've come to prefer, and it goes, you mentioned gene culture evolution, and it goes back to the most famous uh, advocates of that position, Boyd, Boyd and Richardson. They talk a lot about imitation. And they talk about um, two kinds of imitation, prestige-based imitation and what they call frequency-dependent imitation. And I think imitation plays a much greater role in, 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 in the development of individuals' behaviors, ideas, their acquisition of culture, and so forth and so on, than does any direct teaching, although direct teaching also to some degree plays a role. Humans are extraordinarily biologically predisposed to imitate. And prestige-based aggression means that young people and, and even older people are likely to, inter, to, to imitate the most prestigious or high-status members of a society. Why would that be adaptive? Well, the most prestigious and high status members of a society had to get that status from somewhere and they may have gotten it because the decisions they made turned out to be more accurate and better than the decisions other people made. So, well, at any rate, uh, frequency dependent uh, imitation uh, means that people are imitating what most other people do. Well, if everybody else is doing this, or if most people in my group are doing this, it seems like a good idea. This is at an unconscious level, mostly. Both the things are operating at, at, at an unconscious level, mostly. Um, so, so one should develop, sociologists ought, ought to develop an imitation-based theory of socialization, and most, most culture gets transmitted I think through imitation. I just give a personal example. I have two granddaughters, one six and a half and one one and a half. Um, I was living in California for a few years and I moved back here to Pennsylvania four years ago and my older granddaughter was two and a half and she liked to play with me. We got along very well. Her imitation of me was absolutely stunning. If I said something to her, she would say it back to me, and she would not only get the words right, but she would have the, the same tone of voice, the same intonation, and, 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 and everything. Her, her imitation of me was absolutely astonishing. Now, my, 
my younger granddaughter, who's one and a half, I see is now starting to imitate me as well. If I do something, my glasses slide down my nose a lot. I push them up. The other day I was with my younger granddaughter and my glasses started sliding down my nose. She would reach up and, and push them up. See? She does what the older person does. Uh, and, you know, a grandpa to her, to a one and a half year old, is a high status pre prestigious person. Um, I think this fits with, with what humans are biologically predisposed to imitate. And they're biologically predisposed to imitate those behaviors which are which likely evolved because they were the most uh, adaptive behavior. That's one way of uh, addressing your point, I think. Did you want to? And it's not only imitation, but also the fact that humans and human children uh, are particularly predisposed in comparison with other species and particularly our closest primate cousins, let's say, to over imitate. I mean, there are a lot of experiments where people uh, show, for example, chimps and children how to perform a certain task and they go through uh, redundant or irrelevant steps purpose, uh, purposefully just to see if they also imitate what is irrelevant or not or if they go right to what they want to do there and children tend to stick to all of the steps that they mm -hmm. observe uh, and the chimps for example I if they want to take an apple uh, 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 out of a box they simply lift the cover or something like that and grab it and and that's done i mean the uh, even here we're talking uh, we're talking about a, a species a, a typical behavior of over imitation i wasn't aware of those studies to be honest but i'm not surprised so humans having much bigger brains a much bigger cerebral cortex would pick up much more from the person that they are imitating and um, and thus would be more likely to go through this this uh, sort of stereotyped uh, series of uh, steps but that's an interesting point um, I haven't read everything, you see. I I miss some things. We can't read everything. We don't have an, we don't have enough lifetimes <laughs> to read everything. Yeah, yeah, it's really frustrating. So, yeah, uh, uh, I have, have, I, I've been acquiring all these books lately, and I have Now I'm up to about ten, and I just got two more today. <laughs> How am I ever going to get through all of these? Some of them are some of them are big books, but. Yeah, my reading re list is also virtually infinite. So, <laughs> yeah, and uh, for reading, you know, if you're if you're doing a lot of time writing, if you're writing articles and you're writing books, that's less time for reading. You know, uh, so over the years, as I began to write more and publish more, my reading time, uh, the amount of time I had available for reading, um, went down. Now that I'm retired, I have more, but I still don't have nearly nearly enough time mm -hmm. right so uh, let's now shift gears a little bit and talk about uh, an approach that you have in your work that you call uh, darwinian conflict theory because th this is very interesting because you try to marry let's put it that way uh, the darwinian approach to human behavior that is the one based on evolutionary theory, on natural yes. selection, with certain interesting insights that, that you deem as useful that came from Marx. So, could you give us perhaps a brief overview of how that approach would work? Uh, yes, I just published the full... I think I sent you the article I wrote on that la about three years ago. Um, Darwinian conflict theory, a unified evolutionary theory of human uh, 
society. Well, sociobiology and evolutionary psychology, you know, what we might do, we don't even have to use those terms. We can talk about a Darwinian pers evolutionary perspective or just a Darwinian perspective. Some people actually talk about a, so they talk about selectionism. And, and that avoids getting around, well, are we going to say sociobiology or are we going to say evolutionary uh, psychology? So sometimes I prefer just to use the Darwinian, the term Darwinian or Dar uh, Darwinian evolutionism. It's incomplete. It's not a complete theory. Now, I, I've been told, I don't know if this is true or not, and I don't know if you explored this with Lita Cosmides. Uh, Cosmides and Tubi seem to talk sometimes as if they have a they have a complete theory of human be behavior but I'm not sure they believe that um, certainly they think they have the best theory but is it a complete theory no it's not a complete theory because it doesn't take into consideration all of these uh, socio-ecological contingencies that I that I talk about so in my earlier work, which was on social evolution and had nothing to do with biological evolution, I worked on social evolution from about the late 70s until hmm, maybe the late 90s or early, pretty much then, uh, about a 20 to 20, uh, a five-year uh, period. Uh, and I had a materialist theory, and it borrowed heavily from uh, two people, Gerhard Linsky, who's a a famous sociologist who was a, a reviver of social evolutionary theory back in the 1960s, actually, and an anthropologist by the name of Marvin Harris who developed a, a, a perspective called cultural materialism. And uh, when I read their works around 1976, I think it was, I had an aha experience. I saw them as very similar, and I saw them as the basis for um, a theory of human society, an evolutionary theory, but a social evolutionary theory, not a biological evolutionary theory. So I haven't abandoned those ideas. I haven't abandoned them, although I've become somewhat more critical of them. Uh, but I use them as part of the, of, of the missing ingredients in, in Darwinian theories. Darwinian selectionism Cognitive modules, whatever you want to call them, operate in the in a context, a socio-ecological context, and um, I emphasize that the most important part of this context are the material conditions of social life. First person to talk about that, to my knowledge, was was Karl Marx, um, but he did it, I think, in a in a rather inadequate and, 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 and fairly narrow way. Marvin Harris took over some of these ideas back in the 1960s um, and, and he expanded the material conditions of, uh, of social life to, from, from, from Marx's into four and he called these ecological conditions features of the natural environment, uh, demographic conditions which are um, features of the population, how large is it, what is the sex ratio, how densely populated is it, and so forth and so on. And then the others were, were uh, economic uh, conditions and um, economic conditions of the type that uh, Marx was talking about, and then technological conditions, tools, uh, the level of technology, and so forth and so on. And he thought that most human behavior was adaptive. He didn't mean biologically adaptive. He meant socioculturally adaptive uh, within the framework of these kinds of conditions. These conditions, one or more of them, perhaps all of them, uh, tend to shape the kinds of adaptive structures, mean, meaning the structures of society, or you talking about so-called sociocultural systems, are primarily determined by by, by these conditions, and he labeled these the, the infrastructure he was sort of building on, on Marx's base, infra, uh, base superstructure distinction, and he called these the infrastructure, then he had something called the social structure, which was family life, gender roles, politics, and then the superstructure, which is sets of ideas, religious ideas, ideas about um, 
art, music, uh, ethical principles, and so forth and so on. And he argued that the infrastructure has a, has the biggest influence, has a large influence on the social structure, which in turn has a large influence on the uh, superstructure, although there may be a certain reciprocal influence in that the superstructure may reflect back on the structure and the infrastructure. This is part of what I meant when I said that behavior tends to precede ideas. Ideas are built around behaviors which have evolved because they're adaptive in some way or another. So uh, I add those can I I add those things in. I also uh, uh, use a kind of conflict theory. Uh, it's a it's a less Marxian and more Weberian kind of conflict theory, and based on the ideas of a excellent sociologist by the name of Randall Collins, uh, social life is filled with conflict, with competition for resources of all kinds, economic, political. Uh, religious and so forth, and people are constantly competing and coming into conflict over these kinds of things. Um, then there's an approach called uh, rational choice theory, not popular among sociologists because it doesn't fit very well into the standard <laughs> uh, social science model. It assumes that individuals are trying to maximize, the, individuals are self-interested. Some people use the word selfish. I shy away from that and tend to uh, prefer the term self-interested. They follow their own interests, and their own interests are more important uh, to them than, than the interests of uh, other people. People are more interested, for example, in their own children and the success of their own children than they are in the, the, the success <laughs> of other uh, people's children. Uh, so that's in selection, right? Well, that's, of course, in selection. If you're more interested in other people's children than your own, that's not an adapt that that's not a Darwinian <laughs> adaptive behavior. You're promoting the other family's reproductive success and diminishing your own uh, reproductive success. And then the last uh, the last part of it is, is to take a social evolutionary perspective by looking at how societies have evolved over thousands of years. Uh, so I add these things in and sort of try to build them into a, an overall framework. And if you read my article, you see I have all kinds of axioms and postulates and I have about 350 uh, propositions, many of which, many of which have strong supporting evidence behind them. Mm -hmm. Right. So it's a, it's a kind of it's a kind of completion. Uh, this is a slight aside, but I'll be brief. I read a lot of books on quantum mechanics. I'm interested in all kinds of doing. This is bedtime reading. Okay, mm -hmm. I I I only have a very thin understanding of all this kind of stuff. But you know, the two fundamental theories in 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 modern physics are relativity theory from Einstein, which has never been falsified, and quantum mechanics um, from people early in the 20th century, which has also never been falsified, but they're incompatible with each other. They don't, they don't fit together, and it was Einstein's great goal, which he never achieved, was to try to develop a unified theory which would incorporate uh, both of them. And so the latest book I'm reading, the uh, uh, the physicist is saying, the problem with quantum mechanics is it's incomplete. We need to complete it. Well, the problem with evolutionary psychology, the biggest problem is it's incomplete. It, it, can't, be a, it can't be a complete theory of society. They're leaving a lot, out a lot of other stuff, uh, which is not necessarily bad. You can do everything. But um, actually, all theories are incomplete. I don't. I don't know that we can ever develop a complete theory of human behavior or human society. But we can move in that direction. We can get. We can try to get closer and closer. And the physicist I'm reading now says says the same thing. We may never get this. We may never get a complete or and true theory. But we can try to get closer. Mm -hmm. And so that's what I'm trying to do. And in Darwinian conflict theory. So far as I know, it's never had any impact on a single person. <laughs> this is the one of one of the problems. But it 
you know, sociology wouldn't be receptive. Most sociologists wouldn't be receptive to that. Mm -hmm. Right. It violates the SSSM. Yeah, Mo mostly because of the Darwinian part, right? Yeah, mostly because of the Darwinian part, but also to an extent, a lot of the other parts too uh, would be objected. It would be objected to. So, um, but I'm a maverick. I go my own way. I don't imitate other sociologists, uh, or I I never had a mentor. Most people talk about their mentors. I never had a mentor. I don't have a mentor now. I work almost entirely alone, almost entirely in isolation, and I'm perfectly, I'm perfectly happy with that. Hard. To, it would be hard to have a mentor in sociology since almost no one thinks the way I do. I've been a mentor though, <laughs> a little right. bit. I've had some students who I've influenced in in some ways. So. Uh, Okay, good, good to know. So let's just perhaps talk about another one of the big topics that you've explored in your work and that basically you talk a lot about in your book, uh, Religious Evolution, Evolution and the Axial Age. Yes. Uh, be, because, I, I mean, I've been having quite a few people on the show that do work in... Uh, the cognitive science of religion. So this yeah. is a topic that interests me quite yeah. a lot. And in your book, you basically... Can I ask who these people were? Well, it was one of the pioneers of the field, Robert Macaulay. Uh, I yeah. also talked with uh, Edward Slingerland, with yeah. uh, Zim Sharif, uh, with yeah. jo Justin Barrett, yeah. jo Joseph Bulbulia, yeah, uh, and I'm I think familiar yeah. with all of them. Yeah, how about Pascal Boyer? Oh, Pascal Boyer, I haven't yet had on the show. Uh, I hope that someday yeah. <laughs> I will be able to have him because he even recently published uh, a new book that yes. is very interesting. Mind I, makes societies. Yeah, minds yeah. make societies. Yeah, I have that, that on my table, and I haven't. I've read about half of it. Mm -hmm. It's a mistitled book. It should be called The Brain Makes Societies because that's really what he's talking about. The yeah, I mean, I mean there, there's, the that, there's that issue of uh, our innate tendency to have an intu a dualistic intuition yes. right, when it comes to the right. brain and the mind. So, right, of course. Uh, so, uh, so many times, I guess, that when people... Uh, um, in the social sciences and the neuroscience perhaps are referring to mental mechanisms mm -hmm. perhaps they are um, they mean mostly what occurs in the brain but i mean they they have to they have to use these um, they have to use these words these labels to refer to perhaps collections of behaviors or of, of phenomena as we experience them consciously because it's easier to understand it to understand them that way I don't know yeah but he's talking Boyer is talking about the brain uh, some people might think uh, um, if they if they saw the title of that book he means the mind in the sense that say the social constructionists or the symbolic interactionists mean that the mind is something detached from the brain and and what's in the mind is all arbitrarily socially constructed and so on um, so um, I've read I've read about half of that book I haven't gotten around to finishing it and some of it I agree with and some of it I don't particularly agree with but he is a great scholar he is a great scholar and uh, his ideas are very, very interesting. So I think an interview with him would be would be um, a very, very good thing for you to do. Mm -hmm. I'm pretty sure he would do one. <laughs>
Mm-hmm. Yes, I will try. So yeah. going going back to my initial question, yeah, uh, sure. you, you yeah, no problem. You wrote a lot about religion, and in your book specifically, you distinguish between three different types of religion. That is, <clears throat> the shamanic type, the polytheistic one, and also monotheistic religion. So, uh, what are perhaps some of the main differences there and what are the socio-cultural ecological contexts that perhaps favor each one of them? Yeah. Oh, well, that's a huge question. <laughs> I right. for about an hour <laughs> on that, um, but I'll try to be, I'll try to be a, as brief as I can. Um, so-called shamanic religions are only found in small-scale societies of mostly hunter-gatherer bands, um, sometimes in, in horticultural societies. Um, the main religious specialist is a shaman who performs various kinds of activities, uh, many of which are public, some of which are private, and he, he's, the shaman is trying, he does a lot of curing. He tries to drive out evil demons that may be causing sickness or the actions of a witch who has harmed a particular individual and, and, and so on. So that's very, you know, that, the shaman is a, the principal kind of religious specialist in a, in a um, very small scale band or tribal society. Uh, the so-called polytheistic religions that, that you're referring to, um, I changed the name of that to pagan. Now, I explained in the book, pagan is an old term which had a pejorative meaning, you know, oh, he's a pagan, meaning not a Christian, he's, he's a heathen, and pagan or a heathen meant sort of the same thing. But lots of religious study specialists use the term pagan, and I, I, I use it to refer to sort of the archaic states, uh, Rome, Egypt, ancient Greece, India, China, and so forth and so on. The ancient states going back four or five thousand years ago, who usually have pantheons of polytheistic pantheons of gods, and each god specializes in a certain kind of thing like like love or war or agriculture or whatnot. The pagan religions, I think, are uh, their main concern is. Um, helping people avoid misfortune and helping people accomplish certain things that are important to them. And the pagan religions usually have, um, they're in a central city, for example, there, there may be statues of the individual gods and people go and they pray to the gods and, and most significantly they all they make offerings to the gods often a meat which they think the, they know the gods are statues but they think that you know the the gods actually consume this well of course they go back the next day and they're the, the meat is still there but then they can say things like well they consume the essence of the meat while not consuming the actual uh, substance of the meat or something like that so people can 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 pray for war, they can pray for, for success in war, they can pray for uh, success in, in, in love or for good crops or, 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 or whatnot, and they, 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 can, they can beseech the God to uh, help them avoid misfortune. We might call these this worldly religions because the main aim of these religions is not to lift individuals up into some kind of afterlife. They're not salvation religions. People are not praying for their salvation. Um, and they generally don't have salvationist doctrines, actually. Uh, and, they're, and they're also not what you call world transcendent religions. Yes, right. They're not world uh, trans- The gods, uh, I should also mention this is, I should have mentioned, the gods are conceived in extremely anthropomorphic ways. Uh, they're like humans, and they have many of the characteristics of humans. They have many of the of the um, flaws of humans. They 
you know, they cheat, they steal, they play tricks on people, uh, they engage in uh, infidelity and all of these kinds of things. But they have some of the good qualities of humans uh, too. But they're like humans. Uh, they're like humans. They're not, they're part of the universe. They're not something outside the universe. They exist at a fairly, one might say, at, at a fairly low level abstraction, uh, whereas the transcendent gods exist uh, they're, they're basically they're basically not metaphysical beings. Yeah, right. Uh, the the pagan gods, you mean? Are right. Yes, that's right. That's that's a good way of putting it. Um, the transition to the it's it's better to say um, the world transcendent or world salvation religions rather than monotheistic because only some of them are truly monotheistic, and those are the Abrahamic religions. Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, which are genuinely uh, uh, monotheistic. The East and South Asian religions, Hinduism, Buddhism, Confucianism, uh, are not monotheistic or not st strictly monotheistic. I try to develop a theory which combines biology and which combines biological evolution and sociocultural evolution. So here we have an example of biological predispositions operating within a particular socio-ecological context. And I sat down, I don't know, maybe 15 years ago or something like that, began to think about the problem of the axial age and the development of these world transcendent religions. And I asked myself the question, well, what was happening in the material realm of society at about this period, the sort of the second half of the first millennium, uh, BCE, what was happening then? What kinds of changes, what kind of evolutionary transformations were taking place that uh, would have inspired or pushed people to develop these new world transcendent religions? And what I discovered was uh, there was a tremendous increase in the frequency of war and a, and, and a tremendous increase in the size of cities. So there was large-scale urbanization on a scale never seen before in human history, and a tremendous bump, a tremendous increase in, 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 in the, uh, the frequency of war, the killing power of war, new weapons were invented, uh, war became more deadly, and so forth and so on. Um, so ba basically, when it comes to the cities, people were uh, they transitioned to a situation where they were living in very crowded places yeah. of anonymous people, mostly. Exactly. Yes, this is an argument I'm making. You had Rome, which I think at its peak may have had about eight hundred thousand people, it had an enormous density, it had an enormous density. So people lived in extremely crowded conditions. And they lived in rather unhealthy, often filthy, uh, and very unpleasant conditions. Um, so that's one. That was one part of the story. I came up with the urbanization idea first, and then as I studied it more, I began to notice a big uptick in in the level and the frequency uh, of war. And I argued that these evolutionary changes were tremendously disruptive of, of people's lives, and they created an enormous amount of what's been called ontological uh, insecurity or existential anxiety. People had new religious needs. The religious needs of people in the old pagan society were uh, largely this worldly. They did. People didn't feel the need to be saved from anything in a heavenly afterlife. They felt the need to escape misfortune in this life and uh, uh, to be favored by the gods for various kinds of success in this life. So they were they were sort of this worldly uh, religions. So, but, so when we talk about the development or the evolution of world transcendent religions, do you think that those socio-ecological uh, circumstances were novel from an evolutionary perspective and then perhaps we can talk about an evolutionary mismatch there? Uh, yes, they were novel. They were certainly novel. People hadn't lived in those kinds of conditions before. Mm -hmm. You could say, well, the Yanomama, a very warlike society, the fierce people, and so on. Um, but 
the kind of war they had was a very different kind of war. Um, and, and they certainly weren't an urban society. And they lived among close kin and, and people they knew. They had, you know, villages where 100 people, 150 people maybe at the largest. And uh, so their level of ontological security was, uh, was much higher. But yes, uh, at the time of the Axial Age, there were these novel phenomena urbanization, large-scale urbanization, and a big, big uptick in war. And these had tremendously disruptive, basically psychological consequences for people's lives. And people began to, people developed new, new religious needs arose. And so a human disposition to think about religious God, religious entities or religious beings um, interacted with these novel uh, social evolutionary conditions to begin to produce new ideas about new kinds of gods who could do new things. Now, there's another element of that, okay? Was it the ordinary was it the everyday person who was thinking of new of a new transcendent God like the Christian God? I don't think so. If you go back to Max Weber, Weber talked about um, a process of a, a kind of unfolding process of internal religious development. He used the term religious rationalization. And, and over hundreds or thousands of years, uh, people develop ideas which are increasingly rationalized. And um, I, I think Weber... Um, in this context talked about the development of new kinds of religious beings, new kinds of religious entities, the movement toward a transcendent God. Uh, but people also felt a, a kind of need for a personal God. So in Christianity, we have, we have God. Well, who is God? What is God? You know, I, I, in preparation for writing this book, I read a very fascinating book called When Jesus Became God. Mm -hmm. You know, when Jesus became God. And it's a very complicated story that evolves over a hundred years, how Jesus and God sort of uh, became merged. Mm -hmm. Way too long a story uh, to, to, to tell here. But you have a God who's outside the universe, a God who's... Uh, not a, doesn't have a body, doesn't have a material existence, uh, but brings the world into being, brings every, in the beginning there was the void, and God then created the world in six days, and then, on the, but this God is a very abstract, transcendent God. But then later, um, of course, this goes back to Judaism uh, centuries earlier. But then there evolved the idea of Jesus, a more personal God. And Jesus, Jesus saves. Jesus, Jesus provides salvation from all the terrible things that are happening in the world and so forth and so on. In Islam, you have, which I don't deal with in the book because I don't know how to deal with it, and it's much later than the Axial Age anyway. Um, in Islam, you have, you have Allah, you have God, but then you also have Muhammad, who's sort of akin to Jesus, and the, the Quran mentions Jesus actually quite a number of times and so forth, and, and is rooted to some degree in, in both Christian and uh, Judaic ideas. So that's the basic argument. It fuses, it fuses a kind of biological evolutionary perspective with a kind of sociocultural evolutionary perspective. Uh, perspective. Um, I gave this a talk on this at UC Santa Barbara, Jesus, I think it was almost 10 years ago now. And, and I didn't have everything worked out completely. I was ignoring the sociocultural side of it, which I added in later. And so people thought up, I said, this was an adaptive phenomenon. The axial age was an adaptive phenomenon. And people thought, a lot of the people there thought I was saying that it was a new kind of biologically adaptive phenomenon, that people's genes were, people actually were evolving new genes, a new kind of genetic structure. So I tried to explain to them that, 
a no, it wasn't that kind. You know, that was the sort of the background, but it was adaptive and it was it was adapted in socio-cultural terms. It was psychologically adapted for the individuals who were living under these novel kinds of conditions. I was immediately jumped on by one of Tubi and Cosmetes' graduate student. You're using the concept of adaptation. That can only mean an increase in reproductive success. So what you're saying cannot be right. Well, then I carefully tried to explain to him uh, that there was a whole tradition of so social or sociocultural evolutionary theory uh, which used the concept of adaptation in a different way. No, nope. he jumped on me again. He just repeated the same thing. So then I repeated the same thing back to him. He jumped on me a third time, after which I repeated myself back to him and I said, look, I'm surprised you don't, you're an anthropology student, but I'm surprised you don't know that there's a very large literature on, on, on so, social or sociocultural evolutionism and much of it uses the concept of adaptation. It's in a different realm. I know what you're saying in the biological realm, but you seem not to know that there's another tradition out there uh, which has a different notion of adaptation. It's not as rigorous, but nonetheless, it's there. I never convinced him of anything. He wouldn't give up. <laughs> he would not. He would not give up. But I was. I said, look, I've written a couple of books on this myself, so go to the library and and, and check it out. This is a tradition that goes clear back to the 19th century. So, so that's at any rate, that's the argument. That's the the, the nub of the argument in, 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 um, uh, about the axial age. Mm -hmm. Okay, so just to not extend this interview too much, let me just <laughs> ask you a, a final question about all of you, all of what you've just said. I mean, there are a lot of topics there that we could explore a little bit more. Yes. But, but one of them uh, strikes me as very interesting. That is the fact that at a certain point you sort of alluded to the fact that uh, it is not easy for us to really get down to what are really the beliefs that people hold in terms of, oh, so do they believe in a abstract uh, um, meta, uh, metaphysical being or do they tend to believe uh, in, a, in an embodied personality like for example Jesus or Muhammad and that's what's more successful at least for common people and yeah. it, it, br it brought to mind the conversation that I've had with Justin Barrett, because at a certain point we referred to the main differences between uh, what he calls natural religion, that is the natural proclivities, uh, the evolved proclivities that people have to develop religious thought and to believe in some sort of religious entity and things like that. Uh, the difference between that and uh, th and formal theology, let's say, because there are lots of things that uh, uh, theologians and philosophers of religion uh, came up with over history that are extremely counterintuitive to people. So do you think that perhaps uh, Christianity and uh, Islamism uh, and Islam and uh, and other kinds of religions, perhaps they felt the necessity of developing these sorts of more embodied entities, like for example Jesus or Muhammad, to perhaps uh, be easier for them to communicate what they wanted to communicate perhaps in terms of moral systems of behavior to common people and that's what one of the main factors that's behind their success 
I'm not sure what your question is, but let me see if I can try to interpret. Are you suggesting that um, people have tried to perfect their thinking or tried to improve their thinking over time, that ideas have their own causes, that there's a kind of internal development that individuals are going through. They're thinking about certain ideas, but as they think about them more and more, um, new ideas begin to develop uh, out of them. In other words, are you talking about some kind of intellectual or cog purely intellectual or cognitive process? It seems to me what you're suggesting. Uh, and that would fit with, I think, what a lot of, I don't know much about theology or modern theologians. This is not something <laughs> I read. Um, but I guess that is, you know, what a lot of theologians would say. Do you know the work of the sociologist Rodney Stark? Uh, I, I'm not sure about Probably about it, you don't. He's, in my opinion, the leading sociologist of religion uh, in, in the world today. He has some, have some very brilliant ideas. Uh, he, thinks, he, he, he thinks something like that. Um, and he argues that God, well, he's a religious person, he believes in a, a God, and he worships, and so forth and so on. Although he was an atheist, but he's, <laughs> he, he, he's converted. And he says, God only imposes on people the kinds of thoughts that they're capable of comprehending at each stage of the development of human society. So in small-scale hunter-gatherer bands or tribal societies, the ideas that God provides people are very crude and they're very primitive because people aren't really capable of thinking in much more abstract terms. And as societies evolve through shamanic to pagan and then later to uh, modern world transcendent religions, God then can show them ideas which are much more difficult, much more demanding, much more, uh, much more abstract. Um, and then he asks the question: Well, is there one of is there one of the modern religions which is the very best one of all? And he, he you can guess the answer. He says yes, and of course it's Christianity. And he goes on to explain why Christianity is the the best of all of the religions. It's it's really the one true religion, I think, for a start. You should interview him. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you have any interest in that. Uh, he's a very argumentative and dogmatic person, but he's a brilliant guy. I, I don't know him. I've never met him. But he's a formidable guy. You might think about him if you have a slot for somebody. He has some brilliant idea. I don't know if I'm addressing your question or not. Uh, yes, j just to rephrase it a little bit, I guess that what, why, what I was asking was, if you think that perhaps uh, Christianity, for example, developed the figure of Jesus because uh, it would have been easier for people to understand what they were trying to communicate yes. in, in terms of a God that then went, of course, associated with a set of moral, of moral beliefs that people yes. should follow, uh, instead of simply trying to communicate a sort of abstract metaphysical yes. ent entity yes. that many times yes. theologians talk about because it yes. would have been much easier for people to understand what Jesus is about than what is some, an abstract some entity. abstract transcendent God who has no body, who has no brain mm -hmm. he sees everything but he has no eyes and so forth. This is exactly Stark's point, this is what made me uh, think that it might be useful to interview him. He says the idea of this world transcendent God, although I don't think he uses that terminology, uh, it's too difficult for for most people. Uh, and Weber, I, I didn't, I should have said this earlier, but Weber says, well, these religious, these evolutionary religious changes are 
really developed by a small handful of people, the religious elite. They, they're the ones who create the idea of a world transcendent God. And then everybody else, or not everybody else, but many people then catch on to this, and then they follow it, even though they themselves, the ordinary person would not have been capable of thinking um, with with uh, of thinking about such a God. But then Stark makes the point that people need a personal God. They, can't, they have trouble relating to this world transcendent God. So they need a personal God, one that they connect with, and then we get Jesus. I think, I think you stated it, actually. Um, I think I'm just sort of restating what you yourself were, uh, uh, were, suge were suggesting. Uh, so there tends to be a, yeah, there tends to, people tend to fall back on the idea of a personal God. Jesus saves. Jesus is my savior. Jesus follows me. Um, um, you know, he keeps me safe. He protects me and so forth and so on. Um, well, I, I, I could say more, but, but, but that's the, the basic idea. And so Weber Said, Weber said much the same thing. And so Stark's point is very similar to, to Weber's. Um, the world religion were created by religious elites. Okay, you know, uh, the, the Jewish prophets. Uh, St. Paul and Christianity, uh, the Buddha, uh, and so forth and so on. And later they begin to filter down to, to others. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay, so Dr. Sanderson, there were a lot of other things that we could cover on this interview, but we've already went for almost two hours now. Yes. So, so I perhaps, sorry. Yes, I see. We've gone for almost two hours. Yeah, I forgot. Yeah. Some, just, just remind me of a couple of other questions. I lost your list of questions. You sent me your list of possible questions. I, I couldn't find it. I couldn't find it. Uh, it's somewhere in the computer, but I couldn't locate it. But just a couple of other questions. I won't answer them. I'm not going to answer them. A couple of other things that interested you? Uh, well, I mean, basically, we covered pretty much the main questions that I had. The rest was simply a list of topics of different aspects of human sociality and of a social structure and things like that, that basically I wrote down just to have uh, topics as examples to talk yes. about if okay. they came up during the conversation. Yeah, but, yeah. I mean, I had a lot of things here like gender roles, marriage, uh, mating, family well, system. Yeah, and, those are great, yeah. Uh, violence and war, yeah. the advent of agriculture and how things changed after that, but yeah, I mean, uh, I mean, perhaps it would be better just for us to end this yes. interview here, and perhaps I if you like, we could do another one in the near future. Perhaps to uh, talking more specifically about certain of these, uh, about some of these aspects of human sociality from. Um, from a Darwinian perspective, mostly, let's say, yes, hopefully, or at least with a biological basis to it. So. Uh, I would be delighted to do that. Um, gender, marriage, um, family relations, um, those are among my favorite topics. Uh, I used to teach a whole course on that, actually, from a Darwinian point of view. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, and violence and war and so forth and so on. Yes, I would be delighted in the near future to have another uh, interview and we could talk specifically uh, about those things. In regard to gender, I might be saying some politically incorrect things. <laughs> well, I, I mean, <laughs> I think the feminists, maybe... some of the feminists get a little bit upset, but 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 most of the evolutionary psychologists would agree. I think, or at least many of them would uh, would agree with much of, much of what I'm saying. So, but but I mean, during this whole interview, uh, 
we were talking about very politically incorrect things here, right? <laughs> and that's making true. a lot of politically incorrect statements. Yes, that's true. Yeah. Okay, so Dr. So, Sanderson, j just before we go, apart from your books and your work that I will be leaving links to in the description box of the interview, would you like to make reference to any online sources that people could go to to learn a little bit more about what you're doing? Uh, yes, if you would tell me how to do that. I, I'm not a high-tech person, so... Um, I have uh, to. Well, uh, you, you have you have your website, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. I. Uh, and you probably also have a profile on ResearchGate with your articles, or I do not. Mm. But I could create one. Uh, okay, so I, I mean, so perhaps I should make only reference to your website, to your books, and leave links to them on Amazon, for example. And yes, that would what, be what, what else would you like from me? Well, that would be enough. Okay, that would be all there is actually. The <laughs> my website and and uh, links to my books on Amazon. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, okay, so just to finish the interview, Dr. Sanderson, it was really a pleasure to have you on the show. I really loved uh, our conversation. So as we already said, we, we're going to have another one somewhere in the near future. To yeah, I'll about. be in touch with you at some point. Mm -hmm. I can get back in touch with you. I enjoyed the interview enormously. I read all those quotes from people that you'd interviewed who said all these wonderful things about you. And I must say they they're true. I'll have to maybe I should write something up and you can you can add it to to the list. But one of the things they said is that you were very well informed, and you were indeed extremely well informed. Um, you you had read a lot of my stuff, and you have a lot of background knowledge. Actually, you asked me questions which you practically answered yourself. <laughs> <laughs> in the in, in the question, um, so yes, it was an extremely uh, good interview and very very pleasant for me as well. Hello everybody, thank you so much for coming to my channel and for watching this interview until the end. As you might have noticed, I've started this channel on February 2018 and have been putting out regular interviews with academics and intellectuals from a variety of fields. So to keep the channel sustainable, I would really like to ask you to please visit my Patreon page and to consider making a pledge there. Any amount, even $1, would already be a great help. Otherwise, and if you like what I'm doing, please share it, leave a like and hit the subscription button. You also have the alternative of supporting me on Subscribestar or Paypal. I would also like to give a huge thank you to my patrons, Karen Litzke, Anne Blanchett, Peruga Larsen, Lau Guerrero, Chantel Geline, Jim Frank, Francis Ford, Hans Frederick Sunda, Brian Rivera, Lucas Stafiniak, Sergio Condriano, Ian Haninen and my two producers, Zizar Weber and Rosie. Thank you for all.